Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The distal wedge procedure is a commonly performed surgical procedure which can be done either individually or in conjunction with other flap approaches. It can be a difficult procedure based on limited access in the retromolar area and due to the nature of the tissue in this area, whether it be gingival or mucosal or both. In this demonstration, we will show a distal procedure utilizing two parallel incisions. Alternatively, the typical distal wedge with a V-shaped incision could be used. These decisions are based on the anatomy of the area and the and presentation of the periodontal problem. Bone sounding is useful prior to surgery to determine the position of the underlying bone and the thickness of the in the area of the wedge. Transgingival bone sounding will give us some indication of where incision should be placed at the start of the procedure. A distal incision spanning from buccal to buccal will be placed. In this model, we have a distal space, but in vivo, this incision could be placed at any distance from the distal tooth, depending on the position of the ascending ramus and other anatomical factors. Two parallel mesial to distal incisions will be placed. The initial incision is placed down to the osseous crest, both on the lingual and buccal. The distance which separates these two, these two incisions will be determined by the presentation of the periodontal problem. Incisions are continued along the lingual and buccal surfaces of the terminal or tooth. At this time, we would like to demonstrate how to thin interproximal papillary tissue during initial flap reflection. While the papilla is at its base, the papilla can be gently elevator, elevated using light tension and the angle of the incision may change to undermine the papilla. The incision is carried to the crest and blended with the neighboring incision. In a similar way, tissues lingual or buccal to the distal wedge can be thinned during early flap reflection. The scalpel angle is changed so that the gingival tissue is undermined during these early incision procedures. The dental assistant can gently reflect the flap and as it's placed under light tension, a sharp blade can undermine the flap down to underlying crestal bone. It is important the crestal bone be contacted and that the incision be continuous from distal to mesial, especially at the distal line angle of the terminal molar tooth. This area frequently causes problems in that adequate flap, flap reflection is not accomplished. By using, by using sharp dissection and a continuous incision to the alveolar crest, the flap can be adequately reflected in this area for access stability. In this case, you can see that an unerupted molar tooth is present in the retromolar area in the pig jaw. We will disregard this finding and treat this area as a typical distal wedge procedure. The operator ensures that the incision is continuous to the crestal bone from the anterior flap area through the distal line angle of the terminal tooth and into the distal wedge area.
In a similar manner, the buccal flap is elevated using, using sharp dissection and undermining thinning incisions which contact underlying alveolar bone. The incision is continuous along the distal line angle of the terminal tooth and can be extended to blend with the anterior flap. The buccal papilla is gently elevated and undermined or thinned. This undermining incision is carried throughout the tissue down to and continuous with the alveolar crest. Again, is it, it is important that the tissue be adequate, re, adequately released distal line angle of the terminal molar tooth in order that the buccal and lingual flap be reflected for access and visibility. The periosteum is incised in a, in a continuous manner from the distal to the anterior portion of the flap. Now the distal wedge tissue itself is excised. It is released from the distal surface of the terminal molar tooth and then will be excised from its osseous base. This should only be accomplished after the lingual and buccal flaps have been reflected in order to allow the operator to visualize this distal wedge tissue. An interproximal knife, such as the Orban knife, can be used to sever fibrous attachment between the wedge tissue and the underlying bone. Once this tissue is released, it can be grasped with a mosquito hemostat, placed under tension, and sharply excised from its osseous bed. Once this tissue is removed, the distal surface of the molar tooth can be thoroughly instrumented and any osseous correction accomplished. The distal wedge can be closed using a variety of suture techni techniques, including the interrupted loop. However, a useful suturing technique to use in many distal wedge locations is the external mattress suture. In this case, we will demonstrate an external horizontal mattress, which will be used to close a distal wedge performed using two parallel incisions. The external mattress suture is first placed in either the buccal or lingual flap. And then the procedure is repeated in the lingual flap using a sequence of placing the suture tip from the oral side of the flap through to the tissue side, back through the lingual flap from the tissue side to the oral side. In this way, the bulk of the suture material lies external to the incision and rests on the gingival tissue as it would on a mattress. The benefit of this suture is that 
pressure on closure tends to exert an apical displacing force on the gingival flaps. ensuring close contact of the gingival flaps with underlying bone and an apical displacement of both the buccal and lingual flap in the retromolar area. A periodontal pack can be placed in this instance or the suture itself can be used to determine the final position of the gingival tissues. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.